Elder Worthlin, I was at that football game and spent 10 cents to watch that great run, but I forgive you. <laughs> Along with Elder Worthlin, I should like to speak tonight to the great army of Aaronic priesthood bearers, and especially to those who are called in these challenging times by divine revelation to be their priesthood leaders. I have had a long life of deep gratitude to the Aaronic priesthood leaders who blessed my early life in ways I will never be able to repay. These good men helped to fill the void left in my life after my father, who had spent nearly all of his married life as our ward bishop, was suddenly taken by an illness when I was five years old. Some years later, in 1940, as a ward deacon's quorum president, I received a letter from the presiding bishopric of the church signed by Legrand Richards, Marvin O. Ashton, and Joseph L. Worthlin. This letter said in part, The presiding bishopric of the church extends to the presidency of the Taylorsville ward deacon's quorum. Congratulations and best wishes on achieving more than 90% attendance in priesthood and sacrament meeting for the year 1939. Can you imagine, brethren, the impact of this letter on a young priesthood bears, these young deacons in our rural ward, and especially the three 13-year-old deacons that comprised the Quorum Presidency? From that moment on, these men of the presiding bishop break became my instant heroes. In more mature reflection on that event, I realized that this letter was largely the result of a faithful, conscientious ward bishopric whose second counselor assigned to the deacon's quorum frequently sat in council meeting in our weekly quorum presidency planning meeting. He was always present for at least a portion of our weekly quorum meeting. Our quorum advisor was the kind of humble leader I envisioned the Savior trying to help Peter become as he admonished the soon-to-be prophet leader of the church, Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. As we sat each Sunday morning in that dimly lit basement room of a 19th century built chapel, this great deacon's quorum advisor poured out his heart to his young flock of either eager youth. With pure love and plain words, he told us of the folly of using harmful substances revealed by the Lord in the word of wisdom. He emphasized the need for us to be clean in body and mind in our personal lives and to be worthy to serve the Lord in the mission field. I remember at appropriate time, with tears in his eyes, he would bear his humble testimony to the members of the deacon's quorum of the divinity of the Savior and of the prophetic mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. He taught us faithfully that we were our brother's keeper and the purpose of the quorum was to bless each member's life. He emphasized that when we passed the sacrament or collected fast offering or cut wood for the widows living in the ward, we were doing just what the Lord would have us do. When one member of our quorum from a less active family suffered a prolonged illness and could not attend priesthood meetings, we would go to his home and he would there receive the weekly priesthood lesson and the fellowship of fellow quorum members. And when another less active member whose single parent was not a member of the church failed to attend, priesthood sessions were held in his home as well. Both of these young men in more recent years have blessed countless church members as they've been called to positions of major responsibility. Many years later, as I stood at the hospital bedside of this dear quorum advisor, as he was about to exchange this life for eternity, despite considerable suffering, he wanted to use that brief time to have me review with him the current circumstances of each of those deacons that belonged to that quorum more than 30 years earlier. His life literally filled the instruction of the Savior to Peter on the shores of the Sea of Tiberias in his final admonition to the apostles, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. The battle for the souls of our Heavenly Father's precious sheep and lambs is raging in every corner of the world. An increasingly permissive culture so heavily influenced by the media, especially television, has caused us all, and especially our youth, to be subjected to a moral wasteland of values. Television in this land, in most instances, has been single-handedly removed 
to remove vulgarity from modern, modern culture by making it the norm. The result is a mass culture driven by profiteers who exploit the hunger for vulgarity and pornograph, pornography and even barbarism. Such influences cannot help but have a demoralizing effect on the religious faith and belief of our great young people. Such is the condition envisioned by Bible and Book of Mormon prophets, and such is the world in which the faithful bearers of the Aaronic priesthood in our time must live and emerge valiant and victorious. Against this worldly backdrop, leaders of the Aaronic priesthood must reach out in love to each young man to help them become truly converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ and live by its teachings, to help each young man magnify his priesthood calling and give meaningful service and prepare to receive the Melchizedek priesthood, and commit to and worthily prepare for and to serve an honorable mission and to live worthy to receive temple covenants and prepare to become a worthy husband and father. Brethren, make sure that the love and fellowship of the priesthood reaches out to each young man in your quorum and that each one is included and is fellowshipped. Since recently returning from a three-year church assignment in Africa and becoming reacquainted with our 30, 23 grandchildren, Sister Lindsay and I have often been requested on such visits to tell these grandchildren a bedtime story that is first true, that is second exciting, and third, one that they have never heard before. Now, all of you grandpas here tonight can understand the challenge that such a request represents. One such true story did come to my mind, however, as we visited recently in the home of a son and his wife who live in a Midwestern city with their five children, including three bearers of the Aaronic priesthood, a priest, a teacher, and a deacon. This story concerned their own father when he was a six-year-old boy. I grew up in rural Salt Lake County when it was an economic necessity to care for a variety of barnyard animals. My favorite animal was sheep, prompted perhaps by the fact that sheep do not require required being milked twice a day and six days a week. I wanted our own sons to have the blessing of being shepherds to such farm animals. Our older sons were each provided with a ewe to teach them the responsibility of caring for these sheep and the lambs that would hopefully follow. Our second son, newly turned six years of age, called me excitedly at my office one cold March morning on the phone and said, Daddy, guess what? Esther, Esther was his mother, you. Esther has just given birth to two baby lambs. Please come home and help me take care of them. I instructed Gordon to watch the lambs carefully and make sure they received the mother's milk and they would be fine. And then I was interrupted by a second phone call later in the morning with the same little voice on the other end saying, Daddy, these lambs aren't doing very well. They haven't been able to get milk from the mother and they're very cold. Please come home. My response likely reflected some of the distress I felt by being distracted from my busy work schedule. I responded, Gordon, the lambs will be all right. Just watch them and when Daddy comes home, We'll make sure they get mother's milk and everything will be fine. Again, later in the afternoon, I received a third, more urgent call. Now the voice on the other end was pleading, Daddy, you've got to come home now. Those lambs are lying down and one of them looks very cold. Despite work pressures, I now felt some real concern and tried to reassure the six-year-old owner of the mother's sheep by saying, Gordon, bring the lambs in the home rub them with a gunny sack, make them warm, and when Daddy comes home in a little while, we'll milk the mother and feed the lambs, and they'll be fine. Two hours later, I drove into the driveway of our home and was met by a boy with tear-stained eyes carrying a dead lamb in his arms. His grief was overwhelming. Now I tried to make amends by quickly milking the mother's sheep and trying to force the milk from the bottle down the throat of the now weak and surviving lamb. At this point, Gordon walked out of the room and came back with a hopeful look in his eyes and said, Daddy, I've prayed we'll be able to save this lamb, and I feel he'll be all right. The sad note to this story, brethren, is that within a few minutes, the second lamb was dead. Then with a look that I will remember forever, this little six-year-old boy who had lost both of his lambs looked up into his father's face and with tears running down his cheeks said, Daddy, 
If you'd come when I first called you, we could have saved them both. Dear brethren of the Aaronic priesthood, of the, of the priesthood, those who are entrusted as keepers of the Lord, precious flock of these wonderful Aaronic priesthood young men, we must be there with the lambs when we are needed. We must teach with love principles of faith and goodness and be righteous examples to the lambs of our Heavenly Father. Each quorum member must be prepared for his future roles, a bearer of the holy Melchizedek priesthood in a world plagued with sin and desperate for decisive moral leadership. I leave my witness that this is God's work. It is the most important work in all the world in which we can be engaged, that we will be instruments in his hands in saving the precious lambs for which he gave his life. I humbly pray in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.